Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Jason. Um, I'm an engineering manager at PagerDuty. Um, I work out of our Toronto office. PagerDuty is about half in Toronto, um, half in San Francisco from an engineering perspective. Um, and I come here today to talk to you about how you can make improvements uh, in your own life. <laughs> so it's a bit of a self-help uh, seminar, I guess. Um, as you can see up there, um, I've been in the software business about 20 years. I spent 14 of that um, as, a, as a somewhat frustrated and angry developer before I, I got into management. Um, I've always really cared about how to make things better um, and, and try to like, understand, figure out how we can improve our processes and things like that. Um, and it wasn't really until later on that I kind of figured out that I wasn't very good at it as an individual contributor. Um, so this is kind of a sum up of a lot of lessons that I've had to learn the hard way, spending time being angry um, and getting over it. Um, so you know, uh, in the intervening years, I've been able to uh, you know learn from my mistakes and have some success. So I'd like to uh, to to share that with you um, and explain like how if the tables were turned and I was a manager and you were trying to uh, you know, get me to help you make some change, um, some, some tactics you could use um, to, to do that. So um, I'm going to go out on a limb and make an assumption. Uh, the assumption is that there's maybe something about your job that if you had a magic wand or some time and autonomy, uh, you'd make better. Um, if that's not you and everything with your technology and culture is perfect, um, please propose an open space talk so I can find out more about where you work. Um, if it is you, uh, I'm going to uh, further guess that you're, you're dealing with one or more of uh, the following kind of situations. Um, maybe you have a complicated code base. Um, maybe it's like the classic ball of mud. Um, maybe it's just a uh, you know, monolith and, and it's uh, causing problems. But you know, it's, it's shiny somehow. It's a product. It's in the market. It has customers. Um, but the engineering's kind of a mess. Um, it was maybe originally hacked together by the founders of your company. Um, you know, they went, you know, did a, a hack uh, incubator and suddenly there's a product and you have to deal with it forever. Um, been down that road a couple of times. Um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe they didn't really know what they were doing. And then they've hired some, they hired some, some crummy engineers and they made it worse. And then they hired some good engineers and that's you and now you're dealing with it. So, um, <laughs> so you know, my, my heart goes out to you. I've, I've been there. Um, over time, or just you know, over time, things grow and they get bug fixes and, and things bolted onto them, and, um, and and it gets to the point where it's pretty hard to work with. So, um, you've got an idea to make it easier, um, and you want to address it. Uh, you want to do some refactoring, adding some tests, whatever. Break up your monolith, uh, whatever it is. Uh, you know, you've got some ideas. Uh, maybe you've maybe you've got some processes that that kind of suck. Uh, they're not a good fit for your team. Maybe your, your processes are a little bit waterfall. Maybe it's this kind of agile. Um, you know, poorly implemented. Um, maybe like a lot of companies, you don't really, you didn't really start out with anything, and then you kind of have, you know, chaos-driven development as your, uh, as your process, and you, and you need to formalize a little bit, um, and because it, it's starting to hurt too. So you've got ideas there where you can make it better. Um, maybe you've got communication problems. You've got silos. You're throwing stuff over the wall. You're throwing stuff at QA. You're throwing stuff into ops and uh, in, get into production, um, and you want to stop. Maybe it's none of those things. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, the point is, you want to make things better. Uh, but then, you know, you have to convince somebody. Um, and good, I wasn't. I, I hoped you guys watched that show. <laughs> um, they maybe maybe your direct manager, um, or or you know, the product manager. Or maybe it's the CEO. One way or the other. You know, you need to make your case. So how do you do that? So I'm going to make the assumption that you know you're not really dealing with this guy. Um, that the person you need to deal with has a, a, you know, some degree of competence um, at their job, and that's important. Um, and I'll be honest, the, the culture and process stuff can be really hard for an individual contributor to make sweeping changes to. That's something where you need you know, really cross-organizational buy-in. Um, and you can do that by sort of building up the political capital that you get from making positive changes in the areas where you do have influence. Um, and that usually is the technology realm to start, and then you can kind of level up from there. Um, so. Most of my examples here are, are in the sort of technology area, refactoring, that kind of thing. Um, but the, I think the broader message, the overall message, is, is applicable to whatever kind of change you want to take. All right. So um, 
Lesson number one, flex your empathy muscle. Um, a lot of DevOps talks talk about empathy. Uh, when we talk about it, we're usually talking about uh, our technical peers. We're talking about empathy between uh, developers and, and operations people. So, you know, things like putting developers on call. Um, I'm on call right now. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and having developers understand the kind of pain that ops goes through. Um, and Agile talks about having empathy for the customer. Uh, but we don't often talk about empathy in terms of the business as a whole. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of other people that aren't technical working in, in a business. There's product owners. Um, you know, we've got engineering managers. We've got salespeople, support people. Everybody has their own job to do. And a lot of times we think that they're kind of clueless, non-technical dolts. Um, but, you know, we ignore the fact that they're probably experts at whatever it is that they do do. Um, and they have objectives of their own to think about. They're probably not actually trying to get in your way. Uh, they don't wake up in the morning and think, how can I ruin Jason's plans today? Uh, <laughs> or, you know, I'm sure glad we have a monolithic code base and I intend to keep it that way. <laughs> they just, they don't see the world uh, the way you do. Um, and that's important to think about when you're talking to them. Um, they have different contexts, they have different goals, and they have different objectives. Um, so if we're making a case to someone, it's important that we don't just talk about ourselves and what we want. We have to try to understand what our stakeholder has on their plate. Um, remember that whoever they are, they're answerable to someone else for some kind of deliverables. Um, even the CEO is answerable to a board of directors. Um, and it's really important not to ignore that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, I'll get into some of the, I guess, the anti-pattern versions of this near the end, but um, it, it's, it's, you have to be very, very, careful and, and you have to think win-win which is from an old I don't know do you guys know the seven habits of highly effective people it's an old book from when I was young um, but that was literally one of them is trying to find a win-win scenario where we can give our stakeholders something that they want while we accomplish our objective um, and that'll go a long way to convincing them so um, you know whatever it is your company does um, it's almost a certainty that you're not selling your customers a nicely factored set of microservices. Um, your product is not a continuous delivery pipeline. Um, your customers don't care about how well you're following the Scrum Guide. Those things are all a means to an end and that's, you know, whatever it is that your business does. Um, they're very important practices, but they're not what gets you paid, right? Someone, someone buying your software um, or, or your, your software as a service is what gets you paid. Um, so your stakeholder has to think in terms of business priorities, and that's their job. Uh, that's not your job, uh, but you do have to think about those things too. If I was giving this talk to managers, I would be saying the other way around. Understand what makes your developers happy, but you're not managers, so I'm telling you, <laughs> understand what makes your managers happy. Um, you know, I think it's important that it work both ways. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, I think that's sort of the, the magic recipe is if, if it does, if you get that two-way empathy going, um, where people are both thinking about how can we, how can we help each other out. Um, but, um, you know, for now, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about how we can influence other people. Uh, I, I know it's not what gets you up in the morning to think about, like, business, business type things. Um, you know, and you, you can say, well, I just want to leave the business to the business people. And that's fair. I get it. Um, but I, I can promise you, the better that you understand their world, uh, the more you can speak their language, and the more effective you'll be at making, them, making positive changes. Um, it's not easy. Um, this is, like I said, it took me a long time of getting this wrong before I figured it out. Um, but, you know, win-win should be kind of the first place you look. So I'll give you a real example from my, from my past. I was a new, new manager. Um, I took over the... Uh, business intelligence team, so we had uh, in internal stakeholders. Uh, we were producing, you know, reports for marketing and finance and that sort of thing on, like, how the business was doing. Um, and the, the, the infrastructure that we inherited was probably about as messy as you can imagine. So it was like a script that someone wrote one day got thrown in there, and then, you know, we had some contractors come in and build some stuff on, like, a open source BI tool, and then a different contractor built something with a different BI tool that they liked. And it all kind of, everyone was kind of relying on it. A lot of other departments were relying on it to do their job, but it was really, really hard to work with from an engineering perspective. Like, every change it was one of those systems where you change one thing over here, and then something over there breaks, and you don't really know why. 
Uh, it was that kind of thing. Like, <laughs> you make a small thing, like you move a little decimal place over there, and you're like, well, all of a sudden this report's wrong. Like, what's going on? It was, it was just a spaghetti mess. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, but at the same time, the team was getting swamped with, with requests. Like, we're getting requests all the time, like, change this, change that, change that. And we, uh, you know, the, they were, people were going straight to the team members and, and asking for these things. So, the first thing I did was like, okay, all requests have to go to me, I'll prioritize, uh, you know, shield the team from that kind of thrash. Um, but we still couldn't really keep up. So I, I got another senior developer, put them on the team. And, uh, and what they did, that, that person, um, they figured out the, you know, obviously could evaluate that things were not in great shape. Um, and, and, but figured out a way to start making changes that were really positive. And this is actually a big um, lesson for me. Um, what they did was they, they found the most frequently requested, the report that was getting the most re change requests, not the one that took the longest to run, not the one that consumed the most disk, disk space while it was running, just the one that they were getting the most requests for. Um, and uh, so they asked for time to just, you know, focus on making that one better um, by kind of cleaning out some of the cruft and building it separate from the rest, rebuilding it separate from the rest of the, of the existing uh, system. So I said, okay, do that, I'll make, I'll make some time for you, I'll, I'll fend off the hordes. Um, and, and so they did that, and, and it actually made my life a lot easier because once that report was rebuilt in this new foundation, um, the changes got a lot easier and it actually freed up a lot of time for the, for the team. And what we were able to do was actually use that as a, as a foundation and port the rest of the reports over to that system. Which, so we ended up with a nice newly factored system that replaced the old janky thing entirely over time. Um, but the way that that happened was you know, kind of solving the biggest pain uh, for me at the, or, and for the business as a whole, really, um, first, rather than saying, let's just, you know, hand grenade the whole thing, nobody gets reports for six months and we'll build a new thing over here. Um, which is, you know, that's an approach maybe younger me would have taken, um, and, but it's not a very effective one. <laughs> so, um, Another thing you can do uh, is spend some time educating and evangelizing um, whoever, whoever the stakeholder you might be imagining is that you need to convince. Uh, they're probably not here right now. Um, they probably haven't seen a lot of these other talks. Maybe they are, um, but maybe their boss isn't. Um, so it's important that we don't assume the person that we're trying to convince um, has all the same context we do and we'll see the value of what we do immediately and enthusiastically. Um, you know, we're, we're probably going to need to do a little teaching um, and it's, that's an opportunity to also do some selling. Um, that's where empathy and understanding your stakeholders' goals is going to help you the most. So while you're explaining what continuous delivery is or what containers are from a technical standpoint, um, you know, you, you can answer that question, what's in it for me to the person that you're, that you're, that you're talking to. Um, and, and so make sure that you address that too and, and don't just focus on the, the shininess of the technology. Um, another example from my, uh, my past when continuous delivery was a new and novel concept, uh, still mostly called continuous deployment. Um, I got pretty excited about it. Uh, I went to a talk uh, by Tim Fitz, uh, who I think made up the term. Uh, and you know, I came to work and I was like, we should do continuous delivery uh, or deployment. And, you know, every commit gets automatically deployed and people went, holy crap, what are you talking about? That's crazy, right? You know, we were used to like QA cycles and code freezes and uh, you know, and, and, and this that was like, you can't just like put something into source code control and have it go like, what are you, nuts? Like everything will break. Um, and I was like, well, you're all stupid. You know, <laughs> don't you pay attention? <laughs> this, is, this is cool now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you should get with the times. <laughs> and, and I realized, I think, you know, this is maybe a turning point for me too. I realized, like, they didn't see that talk. <laughs> so they don't know what I'm talking about. So now it's on me to explain that uh, to, to those people, especially, especially the bosses and, and everybody else. But it was, it was peers and everybody. Like, everybody was like, what? that's crazy. Um, so, you know, think about who, that too. Like, the... It's, it's easy to forget that not everybody has all the same context as you uh, and hasn't spent the time sort of immersed in this kind of stuff as, as everybody else. Um, so, thinking big, starting small. Um, when we do product development, uh, we talk a lot about delivering small increments. Uh, you know, we talk about minimum viable, minimum testable, minimum lovable. Uh, and we always talk about those things when we're talking about uh, products or product features, um, or even new products. Um, when we talk 
uh, when we take on improvement projects, uh, we need to have that same mindset too. Um, we can't take on a project with the scope of taking a five or 10 year old monolithic app and turning it into microservices all at once. Like, um, we can't go from releasing once a quarter, as you know some people do, uh, or every month, to releasing continuously all at once. Uh, the first milestone shouldn't be the promised land you want to get to. Um, you can't. Uh, you have to take baby steps, incorporate whatever lessons you learn, take another baby step. It's boring, isn't it? Um, I know it's not that exciting, uh, but whatever it is you want to do, think about the smallest step you can do to get toward that. Uh, it'll make things better, it'll make it easier to get the buy-in that you need, um, and, and you'll probably learn from it anyway. Um, so you can, you can build trust, you can uh, build capital, and, and continue to uh, continue the, that you can use to continue the initiative. Um, this one's really important. Um, have really understand what you're trying to do. Um, any potential improvement should have a clear testable hypothesis behind it. Um, if you want to release more often, I think that's great, uh, but you should understand why. Uh, it's not because releasing is fun. Um, you want to do it to probably, I'm guessing, reduce production bugs. So is the number of production bugs you have now somewhere easily accessible so you can watch it go down? Um, can you see how your improvements are impacting it? Um, if you want to get all your components into containers, what's the tangible benefit of that to your organization? Um, fewer configuration related bugs, fewer bugs in general, faster deploy times, lower infrastructure costs, all those things are things that you can theoretically get from using containers. Um, which one of those is the biggest pain point for you? Can you, can you articulate that and can you measure it? Um, do you actually have any of those problems? Um, are they the biggest problems versus something else that you could spend your time on? Uh, that, those things are really important to know. And once you have that hypothesis and you know what number you're trying to move, uh, take the smallest step you can, as I said before, uh, that'll impact that number. You know, containerize a, singular, a singer, single service, uh, continuously deploy one small code base if you have more than one. Um, it can be tempting to take other people's metrics or, or say it's common sense to justify these kinds of initiatives. Um, you can read articles and go to talks and hear other people talk about uh, how this or that change made a big impact on the organization. And we can imagine a similar impact on our, uh, on our org. Um, but you have to be careful there. Uh, it's really easy to um, let our own enthusiasm for technology bias our thinking. Um, and uh, justify it to our, so we can justify it to ourselves uh, that we're doing the right thing, but really we're just doing something cool. Um, and it's important to build the discipline uh, to be as rational as possible, and so metrics help us do that. So building the, the um, understanding where, where, where your impact is and measuring it um, kind of helps you get away from the, 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 the anti-pattern where you're, you're bi biasing yourself. Um, when you're talking about things, uh, use the language of experimentation. So be clear to everyone that you're trying these things out as an experiment. Don't promise things that you're not sure you can actually deliver on. Uh, so you're going to try something out. Uh, be clear that it's a hypothesis. Um, these are the income outcomes we're trying to get. Um, not everything works out. Um, so uh, I hope you all know that by now. Um, you can screw up the impl implementation. You can get it perfectly right and find out that it didn't have the impact you expected. Um, so that's why we start small and why we use language of experimentation. Um, big bag releases are, are a bad idea in product development and they're a bad idea in, uh, in te for technical improvements too. Um, so don't promise revolution even if you're sure you can deliver. Um, ask for trust and help. Um, you can't you make everybody happy, uh, and you can't address every, every fear. People will, will find all kinds of reasons to tell you why what you're trying to do is a bad idea. Um, and some of those people are, you know, maybe a little more out to lunch than others. Um, and, and some people just resist change no matter what. Um, the, I, I, find, I always find that interesting. People in software, uh, you know, it's a human tendency to, to fear change and resist change. Um, but we, you know, we work in an industry that's very change oriented. Um, change happens all the time. <laughs> um, but there are still there still are, still are people that will that sort of default to hold on. Um, no, um, not sure why, but they exist, and and you and you have to deal with them. So. Um, Ask, explicitly asking people for trust uh, helps a lot. Um, assure them that you've heard their fears. Don't be like, 
whatever, buddy. Um, because th that doesn't help. That doesn't help them endear yourself to them. Um, assure them that you've heard your fears, even if you think they're crazy. You know, keep that to yourself. Um, and, and that you're open to the possibility that you're right and that you're wrong. Uh, but ask them to trust you and give it a, to, to give it a try. Um, again, a lot of this stuff is hard to do. Uh, business, uh, building a business case uh, for the change you want can make a really daunting task. Um, you don't have to do it alone. Ask for help. Uh, if your manager has a clue, um, this can be a good opportunity to, uh, to work with them. Um, ask, to ask them to help you build a business case for it. Um, they probably understand the business fairly well, hopefully. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, maybe the two of you working together uh, can come up with a, a more uh, a more easy to sell uh, package. Um, ask your peers, ask people who've done it before. Uh, you don't have to go it alone. Uh, another, another thing that I had to learn the hard way, I would, I would you know, come up with a proposal and uh, I'd be like, my proposal. And people would go, ah, you forgot this and you didn't think about that. And I would be like, oh, I did a terrible job. Um, and, and so, you know, you don't have to get it right the first time. Um, so uh, spending more time by yourself, kind of polishing it doesn't really help. Uh, get it out, socialize it, talk to other people. Um, f they'll help you find things you missed. Uh, so getting help is really important. Uh, the more people that look at a plan, uh, usually the better the plan gets. Um, so so those, those are some things you can do. Um, that will uh, that will help you out. So now I also have the what not to do portion. Um, so first of all, don't be this guy um, running around. Do you have these guys in Norway? Think that the world's about to end? <laughs> uh, you know, running around saying we're all going to die uh, is seems fun and gratifying. Uh, it's probably not true, and uh, ultimately nobody takes you seriously. Um, but you know, if assuming this guy is real and not uh, an actor or something, um, you know, one thing to remember is he really thinks that the world's going to end. Um, he believes it truly in his heart, um, and it can. You may find yourself in that situation someday, from you know, from your technical perspective. You know, if you're neck deep in a technical problem and it seems insurmountable, and it's like the third time that month that you're in that situation, uh, you'd be really tempted to just say like, flip the table, uh, declare bankruptcy on technical debt flush the whole code base down the toilet and start over. <laughs> it's very tempting. <laughs> um, and you may truly feel like the right thing to, that's the right thing to do, but recognize that, that is a, you know, that's often a very emotional response and not necessarily a rational one. Uh, it almost isn't ever the right thing to do. Um, once again, I've done it. <laughs> I've regretted it. Um, and you know, keep in mind too that the, the business person that you're, you're talking to, if you're going to come and tell the CEO of, of your company that you need to flush your code base down the toilet, um, they're, that's, their, that's how their company exists because of that product, right? Like it's, it's out there. If nobody's buying it, sure, flush it, whatever. But assuming that you have a job, probably somebody's paying for this product <laughs> somewhere. Um, so it'll be hard to make them believe that you know, we should just like... That was a bad idea. Let's start over. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have written about why giant ground-up rewrites are a bad idea. So I hope I'm not telling you anything that's news. Um, but you know, nevertheless, I've done it a couple of times early on when I was a baby, um, and uh, you know, I've had several developers come and tell me that a code base is unsalvageable. You know, needs to be rewritten. There's nothing in there worth keeping. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced at this point that's, that's never the right solution. Uh, so not a great place to start if you want to make change. Um, this one is a little more controversial, uh, but really watch out for the, this will make everyone more productive when we're finished yeah. argument. Um, if, if someone comes and tells me we should, you know, redo all our front end code in whatever new JavaScript framework came out yesterday, uh, you know, or port all our back end services to Elixir and Phoenix because, you know, it's so much faster than Ruby and it's so much easier to work with and developers will be more productive. I'm going to be like, hmm, I don't know. It's, it's very enticing, right? It's an enticing argument. Uh, you hear about a new framework, you go home and you code a to-do list app or something in it and, and you're like, wow, look at it. It's like, beautiful. And I can reason about it. It all fits in my head and everything's nice and, and, and neat and tidy and I wish my work code base looked like that. Um, and, you know, it's easy to sort of falsely attribute the neat and tidy nature of that new code to uh, the language or the framework that you used when really it's just 
actually small. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't have customers and users and the things that make code bases messy over time. Um, so, uh, you know, it, 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 it's very hard to say, well, first of all, it's very hard to measure developer productivity in the first place. So if you're trying to do something that's measurable and prove that you've made, you've made things better, you're already kind of behind the game because it's, it's actually really hard to do. Um, and, but uh, it, uh, it almost never plays out this way because, because of reality. Um, because you have customers and users and um, it's, unless it is like actually like the story I told about the BI framework, um, that wasn't the justification for doing it with developer productivity. It was more like, um, you know, trying to make it work better. Uh, we got developer productivity out of it, but that wasn't how, where we started. Um, one more. Um, be careful about w how the words you use when you're describing the systems that you have to work with. Um, remember that it didn't spring into existence all by itself. Uh, it was written by human beings who did the best job that they could with the information and knowledge they had at the time. Um, so, uh, in fact, it may have been written by the very person that you're trying to convince that it isn't very good. Um, that, that means you should be a little extra careful about the words you use. Um, it can be very hard to get past, if I'm listening to someone, it can be very hard to get past their bluster if they're just like, this is, this is an abomination. It should never have existed. Uh, it, it's very hard to get to the actual you know, substance of their argument um, if they're using language like that. So you know, turn the vitriol knob down, all the way down. Avoid characterizing the code at all if you can. Talk about it in, in, in very rational terms. It doesn't have unit tests. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't perform very well. Here's a graph. Um, those kinds of things are, are, are much, much more convincing than um, I hate it and it makes me feel bad. Um, that may be true. It's just not a very good argument. Um, and it gives the, re the listener a reason to stop listening to you um, if you're using words like that. Um, it, it, it's easy to, you know, someone who's busy and has 47,000 things on their to-do list and you come to them and say, you know, th this code is, is an affront to Jesus, um, then they're going to be like, okay, oh, yeah, that's nice. I'm going to go to my meeting now. Um, so it'll ensure your, your, uh, your ideas really get nowhere. Um, so. Lastly, um, the, the process of making software, it's, it's imperfect. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's always interesting to come to, um, to come to talks, and especially when people talk about, look at the exciting thing we did at my job, um, and you're like, oh, I, wish, I wish my job's stuff looked like that. Um, and, you know, probably their stuff really doesn't look like that. They've polished it and shown you a nice picture. Um, and it, because really, Things are, things are never perfect, um, and even if they are, that only lasts about three seconds because the world is constantly changing. Um, people's, um, people's tastes and norms um, are always evolving. We always have better information today than we did yesterday, um, and so it, when we strive to make things better, we should always think about how we can make things better for everyone around us um, and not just for ourselves. Um, so um, if I can leave you with a, a parting challenge, um, I would say I would like everyone to go learn about some aspect of your company's business that you don't know something much about. Um, so something maybe in, in a non-technical realm. Uh, see if you can shadow your manager for a day, see what their day is like, um, hang out with the marketing people, see what they deal with, say, hang out with the sales people if you have those. Um, and, and, and get to know what their job is like. Um, if you can, invite them to do the same um, with you. Um, it will make you a better, more well-rounded uh, technologist, and it'll make it easier for you to bring about the kind of change that, uh, that you care about. So that is all. I have some image credits there for my, some of my backgrounds. And uh, if you want to talk about this more, I'll be around. <laughs>